Good morning and uh, welcome to the Department of Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, this is actually the last uh, Grand Round for Hamilton Health Sciences for this uh, academic uh, year. Uh, the next Grand Round will be in uh, September. Uh, I know that uh, uh, the department at St. Joe's may have one for next Thursday, uh, but we don't. So uh, uh, if you are uh, from Hamilton Health Sciences, uh, uh, may, you may want to do the, the St. Joe's next uh, week, uh, but we've elected not to do one this year, being very close to the long weekend. Um, on that, uh, our speaker today is Dr. Nadia Kaladindi. Dr. Kaladindi is an assistant professor uh, of medicine in the Division of Neurology and is a neurologist and neuro-oncologist at the Jervinsky Cancer Center and Hamilton Health, in Hamilton Health Sciences. After completing her neurology residency at the University of Ottawa, she completed a two-year fellowship of neuro-oncology at the Princess Margaret's Cancer Center in Toronto. She has an interest in health system management and healthcare delivery and has also completed a master's of health sciences degree in health administration at the University of Toronto. She has a special interest in treating patients with brain tumor and neurological complications of cancer. So based on that, you know, Dr. Karadinti, no surprise, is going to be speaking to us today uh, around high yield information on brain tumors. Dr. Karadinti is, is one of our newest recruits, recruited through the pandemic. So uh, she haven't had the chance to give us uh, 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 grand rounds as a, in, the, in the new recruit uh, series. So today we will be uh, informed by her knowledge on uh, brain tumors. Without uh, further ado, uh, I will pass it on to uh, Navia. Navia, please go ahead. Thanks, Khalid. Hi, everyone. Um, as Khalid said, I'm Navia Kalavindi. I'm really excited to talk to you about brain tumors, and I'm going to try and keep it relevant and only give you high yield information um, to, to keep interest. So to start with, we're privileged to provide care on lands that Indigenous peoples have called home for thousands of years. I have no conflicts of interest, and I promise I do not own any stock in Kepra, in case you're wondering. Okay, so um, I have three main topics I wanted to cover today. Firstly, I want to discuss the basics of brain tumors. So we'll be talking about primary brain tumors, which is our bread and butter at the Jervinsky Cancer Center, as well as metastatic brain tumors. And then we'll talk about um, common neurological findings that we can have um, in brain tumors and the dreaded topic of localization in neurology. I will try and summarize high yield stuff in five slides. And then lastly, I'll also talk about basics of seizure management in patients with brain tumors. This tends to be a very common um, consult that neurology receives uh, at the Jurovinsky. So I thought it would be helpful for everybody. So to start with, uh, brain tumors can be divided into two main categories, the tumors that start from CNS structures and the tumors that um, come from systemic malignancies and end up in the brain or uh, spinal cord. Um, so there are many, many official classifications and names for brain tumors. What I've listed for you here on this slide are the most common brain tumors that we tend to encounter as neuro-oncologists. Uh, neuro um, gliomas are um, what we, I would say, spend the majority of our time managing at the Cancer Center and the Neuro-Oncology Clinic. Um, so this can entail astrocytomas, oligodendrogliomas, glioblastomas, medulloblastomas, and very rarely um, choroid plexus tumors. Uh, ependymal tumors are also fairly common in the brain tumor population, more common in children than in adults, but we do see them fairly often. And then meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, swanomas, and lymphomas are other examples of the more common tumors that we tend to see. Um, within the CNS oncology clinic at JCC, we tend to not see lymphomas as much. My radiation oncology colleagues see them, but typically these are managed these days by the hematology um, team. So in terms of what the most common brain tumors are, meningiomas by far and large uh, are the most common tumors that we see, and they range in various grades. So they go from grade one to grade three, grade one being 
fairly benign. You know, you can resect them or you can watch them um, and they don't cause too much trouble um, except maybe seizures occasionally, but um, the grade three tumors uh, tend to have a bit more brain invasion and therefore are actually more aggressive pathologically. Pituitary tumors are fairly common as well at 15% of adult brain tumors. Um, and then the last three that we see here are again, the primary group of brain tumors that um, we deal with most often at the cancer center. So these are glioblastomas, astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas. The incidence of various brain tumors can change based on age, as you can see in this um, picture here. Um, for example, oligodendrogliomas here, they're much more common at younger years, and then there's a quick drop off as a patient reaches past 80. Um, whereas, as you can see with glioblastomas, you can kind of see a similar pattern where they increase in incidence as you sort of go through middle age, 60s, 70s, and then there's, there's also a bit of a drop off towards the 80s. So um, I don't want to get too into the weeds in terms of classification of brain tumors, but there have been some very exciting things that have happened in the world of neuro-oncology for us. Um, about a decade or a decade and a half ago, most of the classification for brain tumors was largely um, histological. So look under the microscope, what does it look like? But unfortunately, there's up to a 50% difference in classification between pathologists of classifying oligodendrogliomas versus astrocytomas. And when there's a big difference in prognosis for these two tumors, it makes a big difference for us to have the diagnosis right the first time around. Um, so in 2016, the World Health Organization took a fantastic first step from going from um, a purely histological diagnosis to starting to incorporate molecular markers that really um, classify the tumors a lot better. And so the two big things that we switched to in 2016 is the idea of IDH wild type um, versus IDH mutant tumors. We do um, have experience in these tumors where we know that the IDH mutated tumors have a far better prognosis. They tend to be less aggressive. Um, so this really helps direct our therapy and our conversations around prognosis. And then hot off the press in the fall of last year, we upgraded that old system to this brand new system of classification. Um, as you can see, there are a lot more letters and numbers that are included in how we grade and classify these tumors. You do not need to know all of the, all of the nuanced details, but what I will do for you is break it down to the most important things that you need to know in the next three slides when it comes to um, common gliomas. So glioblastomas, these are still the most aggressive tumors. I'm sure you've all heard of them or have had patients um, who have had glioblastomas. Um, unfortunately, survival is um, quite poor in these patients. Overall survival is between one and a half to three years from the time of initial presentation and diagnosis. We do not have a cure um, for glioblastomas, but really what we try to do is try and halt further tumor growth and maintain quality of life and overall survival for as long as we possibly can. One thing that um, you may have noticed when you hear about glioblastomas, the first thing an oncologist asks is, are they methylated or not methylated? What we're referring to is a molecular marker called MGMT promoter methylation. When the MGMT promoter is methylated within a glioblastoma tumor, it makes the tumor more susceptible to damage from chemotherapy. And therefore, we, we usually get better control of the tumor as opposed to tumors that do not have the MGMT uh, promoter methylation. So I have a little um, memory trick here. Promoter unmethylated means unfavorable. And really the thing that makes the biggest difference in terms of survival for all of our patients is the extent of surgery. So gross total resection always um, tends to have a, a better prognosis than a biopsy alone. And you know, patients 
functional status before the diagnosis and after surgery. And as I said, the molecular markers tend to be extremely important in these patients. Um, unfortunately, the treatments have actually not changed much in the last 15 years. Our standard of care treatment in 2005 is actually still um, what our standard of care treatment is for the most part for uh, glioblastoma patients at this point. Um, we've done a number of trials and unfortunately nothing has really um, panned out yet. Um, our standard of care typically involves gross total resection as much, so take out as much tumor as we can. Um, and then we treat our patients based on age and performance status um, with six weeks of concurrent chemo radiation. So we combine radiation with temozolomide chemotherapy, and then we follow that up with six months of chemotherapy alone. Inevitably, all of our patients do progress despite this treatment. And we don't have a lot of second line options, but our next go-to is CCNU or lamustine. Um, and rarely we do use etoposide if the patient's performance status is still satisfactory despite multiple recurrences. Um, aim of treatment here is really to control the tumor rather than to cure the tumor. As you can see, I do mention Avastin as one of the second line options here. This drug we know from our research does not actually increase overall survival. What it does do is help us bring down the use of dexamethasone. Um, in progressing patients. Um, next up, we have astrocytoma. So I think this category is probably what has changed the most um, within these common gliomas in, in the last, uh, I guess, eight months since the new uh, classification criteria has come out. Previously, we would only grade astrocytomas as grades two to three. But based on various molecular analyses and looking at survival demographics, we've actually um, included a grade four category to astrocytomas. And people always wonder what is survival really like between the grades? So I've listed it out for you on average. Grade two astrocytomas, um, typically um, they start growing within the first um, five years. Overall survival can be five to seven years, sometimes more. Grade three is a little bit um, lower than that, so three to five years on average. Grade four um, anecdotally is 1.5 to three years, but we don't have a lot of data on this because this is a, a newer criteria that we've just come up with. Um, of course, some of these numbers are a little bit outdated because I, I think overall our survival and ability to support patients through chemotherapy has improved over the course of the last two decades. And again, similar to the glioblastoma, as the extent of surgery, patients' performance status before and after surgery, as well as the molecular markers, are still the most important factors in knowing where along the spectrum of survival a patient may fall. Um, so in astrocytomas, um, the mutation that we look for is IDH status. So if we go back to Krebs cycle from undergrad and med school, IDH is one of the Krebs cycle enzymes. And mutations in this actually um, lead to patients having better survival outcomes. And the wild type status, unfortunately, has shorter survival. Unfortunately, treatments, again, for this have not changed a whole lot in the last 15 years. Um, in Hamilton, we still do six weeks of concurrent chemo radiation, again, based on age and tolerance, as well as um, 12 cycles of adjuvant temozolomide. There is some new evidence to suggest that perhaps we don't really um, see any true benefit in combining chemotherapy and radiation in astrocytomas, but that hasn't taken on into guidelines or practice yet. And second line options are very similar. Once again, aim is to treat um, rather than to cure. And lastly, um, the third type of tumor that we tend to see often within the glioma world is oligodendroglioma. So by definition, these are tumors that have 1P19Q co-deletion. So this is a molecular um, marker that we almost always test in patients that we suspect of having oligodendrogliomas and is a defining feature. A uh, glioma that does not have 1P19Q co-deletion, that's a grade two or a three in appearance, uh, is most likely going to be an astrocytoma. So 
As you can see, survivals are so much better in oligodendrogliomas. So grade two oligos, um, we see survivals of over 15 to 20 years. Um, and grade threes shorter than that by about 10 to 12 years. But overall, you know, if you were to have any type of any one of these three gliomas, this is really the one to have. Um, again, extent of initial surgery, um, clinical status and molecular markers, once again, make a very big difference in survival. And similar to the astrocytomas, the IDH mutated um, and wild type status carries uh, a similar uh, prognostic benefit. So there are some controversies in how we treat oligodendrogliomas. And I think there is this ebb and flow for how we've traditionally treated them in Canada. Um, the the best evidence is actually for PCV, so procarbazine, CCNU, vincristine, but this tends to be a fairly challenging chemotherapy regimen for a lot of patients to tolerate. So by extrapolating from prior data for the last decade or so, most of us, I think, have been using um, temozolomide instead of PCV for convenience, better tolerability, um, and it's we don't truly really know if it's inferior um, to PCV. Um, so there's been a shift, particularly in the last year or so, where some of us have started to really consider switching back to the PCV, especially in younger patients that are going to be on chemotherapy probably multiple times upon recurrence. Um, this is particularly interesting because we're seeing that prolonged exposure to temozolomide actually causes hypermutations within the tumor itself. So um, they become less sensitive to chemotherapy. So in patients that live for 20 years and are expected to have multiple recurrences, um, this is a very important consideration for overall control of the tumor. Again, aim is still control rather than cure because eventually, even if it takes 20, maybe sometimes 25 years, these tumors will always recur. So the new classification system um, from 2021 reflects increasing knowledge of, of tumor subtypes as well as behaviors. And we're now able to have um, more targeted conversations with our patients. We're able to give them better information so they can plan out their lives. Um, and you know, it's amazing that we're switching to new classification system, but sometimes it's hard to compare a classification system to, um, to survival because a lot of our clinical trials have and are still using the, the older or 2016 criteria, which when you think about it is, is only five years or six years old at this point. Um, unfortunately, we don't have new treatment strategies for um, glioblastomas or astrocytomas or in fact oligos. So it's really important that every cancer center and institution supports clinical trials so that we can discover new drugs. So now we're going to move on to the METs. I know nothing about these kinds of METs, so we will be talking about CNS uh, METs instead. So metastatic tumors are actually much more common than primary brain tumors within the adult population. So about 10 to 30% of patients who have any kind of systemic malignancy um, can develop brain metastases at some point in their course of disease. And over the course of the last two decades, the overall incidence of metastatic disease has actually in been increasing worldwide. I think part of this is better diagnostic um, abilities, better imaging modalities to catch some of the smaller, more subtle mets that we previously would not have been able to catch with a lower Tesla MRI or um, you know, CT with contrast. And um, I think we're also seeing much better systemic disease control and longer survivorship. survivorship. So these patients are living longer and there's more of an opportunity statistically to actually develop metastatic disease in the CNS. So this is a classic um, exam question, I think for multiple specialties. What are the most common metastases into the brain from systemic malignancies? Most common tend to be lung and breast just by how common these um, cancers are within the entire population. But in, uh, in terms of how many people with specific cancers, 
end up developing, met developing metastases, it's usually lung that's the most common. So uh, up to one in five people with a, with a lung cancer can develop uh, brain metastases. Um, melanoma and renal cell carcinoma are kind of around the same range where one in 10 develop um, brain metastases. And what's interesting is that both of these mets tend to bleed in the brain. Um, breast cancer is about one in 20, but again, just because of how common breast cancer is, um, we tend to see that more often. And colorectal cancer is about one in 100, so not as common. And the majority of mets actually present within the cerebral hemispheres. Um, about 80% of them do, and 15% in the cerebellum, 5% in the brainstem. Most of this is, is having to do with um, hemat hematological spread into the watershed areas where the blood vessels are the smallest that they typically are, and you get clumps of cells that kind of plug the, the plumbing um, and tend to get stuck there and grow as tumors. Definitive diagnosis for metastases is always through a pathological um, sample. So METs can look so different. Um, MRIs are always better than CT, uh, MRIs with contrast. So you can have solitary metastases like the first picture that you see here that can bleed. So you have a blood fluid level on the first picture here, or you can have multiple metastases. So the second picture is actually a patient of mine with a pelvic or gynecological malignancy and metastatic disease. Um, and how do you differentiate metastatic disease from any other thing that, that can get into the brain, if, for example, primary brain tumors or infections, et cetera? Um, you know, to simplify it very much, METs typically tend to be very well circumscribed. Um, and we look at the location, so we're looking at that gray-white matter boundary um, um, where they tend to get stuck and grow. And METs usually involve multiple lesions, and there's always a lot more edema surrounding metastatic disease than oftentimes primary brain tumors. And they're typically always contrast enhancing. This is an interesting image of a non-contrast CT scan where you see bright Right, or, or what I should say, hyperdense lesions, um, which is quite unusual, but this can typically mean that these metastatic lesions may have a hemorrhagic component. Uh, they can be extremely hypercellular or they can just be plain old simple calcified. Um, I love mnemonics and I love these for my rural college, so maybe this will help um, people remember. So anytime you see bleedy METs, so the METs that tend to hemorrhage, the mnemonic is MRCTBB. So melanomas and renal cell carcinomas are like the classic cancers that everybody knows tend to bleed once they get to the brain. Um, and then you have choriocarcinoma, thyroid carcinoma, and, and um, bronchogenic as well as breast carcinomas. And then calcified METs, so um, the mnemonic is bottom. So these are the METs that tend to get in the brain and they tend to have calcification. So they, tend, they look bright on CT, even without contrast. Um, so breast cancer, osteosarcoma, papillary, thyroid um, cancer, ovarian cancer, and, and um, so ovarian cancer, especially mucinous ovarian cancer. Um, and... In terms of management, it's largely dependent on the number, location, and size of metastatic disease. Um, it's the first question we always ask when we see METs is, can we do surgery? Is it reasonable for surgery? Can it be radiated and would we use whole brain radiation or stereotactic radiosurgery? So typically, most of these patients get referred to neurosurgery and um, radiation oncology. Until more recently, we have not had many systemic therapy options for treating metastatic disease. Um, the limitations being the blood-brain barrier. How do we get some of these systemic um, chemotherapies into the brain to actually address the, the tumors? And there's also a high degree of CNS toxicity. Um, but lately, especially in the world of melanoma or ALK-positive lung cancers, immunotherapies and targeted therapies have absolutely been changing the world of oncology where we're seeing amazing responses intracranially to systemic um, targeted therapies. And, you know, within the neuro-oncology world, um, we, we also try to support these patients by helping um, manage steroids, 
um, when there's a lot of edema surrounding these um, tumors. And neurologists and neuro-oncologists also oftentimes get involved for seizure management in these patients. So clinical presentations of brain tumors, everybody hates localization if you're not a neurologist, but I promise I'm going to try and make it as simple and easy to remember as possible on the next few slides. So brain tumors can present in any way, shape, or form. Um, you can have, I, I won't read out this entire list. You can, you can read that yourself as well, but we will come back to it shortly. It all comes down to location. So, um, you know, the mantra in neurology is always localized, localized, localized. One of my neurology staff in residency used to say that MRIs only existed to confirm what the neurologist already knows. Um, so in honor of this mentor, I thought I'd give you a high yield breakdown of what neurological findings we can expect to see based on the cere uh, cerebral lobe involved. So these are the four lobes and um, we'll start with the frontal lobe here. So I've broken it down. The gist of it is that the frontal lobe controls motor function. So how you're walking. So you can see ipsilateral, um, uh, sorry, you can see contralateral weakness um, compared to the lobe that's potentially um, impacted. You can see spasticity based on how long the lesion has been there. Um, the premotor and supplementary motor cortexes, which are um, ahead or anterior to the primary motor cortex. Um, this is involved in motor planning and associative learning. So apraxias or understanding how to physically learn and make um, what colloquially we call muscle memory type of movements. Your frontal eye field, so how your eyes are actually um, moving, the deviation of your eyes is controlled through the frontal lobe. So this is why often when patients have a stroke, you, we, we say look towards lesion. So um, the eyes are oftentimes deviated towards the side of the, of the lesion. And then more, and most importantly, and the thing that's most apparent for uh, people observing these patients is uh, if the Broca's area is hit, then you can have an expressive language deficit, especially if um, it's a dominant hemisphere that we're looking at. So the left side is typically the dominant hemisphere because the majority of us are, are right-hand dominant people. Um, and then there's a prefrontal cortex. That's the most interior um, part of the frontal lobe. And this is the part that's really involved in personality, behavioral um, and emotional responses, judgment, sequential tasking. So if I have to, um, you know, go from point A to point B, what are all the things I need to do to get there? And um, executive function problem solving. So if this area is impacted, you'll see cognitive dysfunction and behavioral abnormalities. Um, so the temporal lobe, this is the, the sound and speech um, part as well. So the sound part, this is where your auditory cortex is. So sometimes if this area is impacted, you can, patients have trouble actually knowing where a sound is coming from. They don't have a tonotopic map um, of where they're hearing noises from. Sometimes they actually just have verbal or nonverbal auditory agnosia. So um, people are saying things to them and they just don't process what they're hearing. And then Wernicke's area is the other big area of, of um, responsibility for language. So if you have a hit to the Wernicke's area, you're going to have a receptive aphasia. And um, if it's on the non-dominant side, it's very interesting. These patients um, have a hard time understanding people's um, prosody or sarcasm, um, rate, rhythm, pitch. So it, the social interactions sometimes become, sometimes become very challenging for these patients when everything else seems completely normal. And then very interestingly, the, the middle and mesial part of the temporal lobe is a part that has a lot of limbic connections as well as olfactory and gustatory input. Um, and more importantly, memory and learning. So you do see a lot of patients, I, I see a lot of patients who suddenly had um, unusual memory deficits over the course of several months. We do a scan and unfortunately we find um, uh, a, a mesial temporal lobe um, glioma 
And next is the parietal lobe. So this is the sensory lobe is um, an easy way to remember it. So this is where all of your primary sensory modalities, as well as your secondary sensory modalities that include gaphesthesia, um, stereognosis, and um, somatosensory extension. Um, you don't need to worry about the secondary sensory deficits, things like pain, temperature, vibration, proprioception, all of that is really sensed in the parietal lobe. So that's how you get um, lesions that lead to contralateral sensory deficits um, within the uh, cerebellar, sorry, cerebral lobes. You also have the angular gyrus. This is probably more um, often picked up by neurologists. So these are you know, hits to the dominant hemisphere angular gyrus can actually lead to very interesting apraxia. So again, um, an inability to actually um, imitate gestures. So for example, idiomotor apraxia is an inability to um, imitate gestures um, or pantomime, um, they pantomime hand use instead of actually uh, demonstrating how they would use various objects and ideational apraxia um, basically means that they the patients can't actually perform a set of related tasks in um, in an order um, where they're able to accomplish a particular task. And lastly, the occipital lobe. So this is the vision lobe. Um, so hits to this is usually what leads to visual field deficits. You can have a homonymous hemianopsia. Um, if you have a hit to one side, so it would be a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia. Um, there are very interesting nuanced little areas um, within the occipital lobe where your brain can sense where something is where, versus what something is. And if there are hits to this area, sometimes patients don't really understand what they're looking at or where it is that whatever they're looking at is actually located. So these are very, very interesting neurological findings. And then just very briefly, other structures, you know, things that you can see when there's a hit to the cerebellum, you can have uh, balance, coordination, ataxia, um, uh, difficulties, and you can also have an unsteady gait. Within the brain stem, you can have anything and everything really within the brainstem, because I really think of the brainstem as the funnel between the brain and the spinal cord and pretty much all of your um, functioning fibers go through the brainstem. So you can have motor, sensory, uh, reticular activating systems, so your consciousness, sleep, all of that can, can actually be affected as well as obviously cranial nerve function. And then if you have tumors within the ventricular system, you know, the one of the more common things that we see is obstructive hydrocephalus or ventricular trapping potentially as well with, um, with tumors within the parenchyma that can, I guess, squish the ventricles. And common symptoms of, of issues within the ventricular system could include headaches, gait difficulties, urinary incontinence, just functional decline that we can't really explain, um, as well as symptoms of increased ICP. So we're going, we're coming back to the slide and I, I hope having gone through the last few slides, it's going to be easier for you to localize every single one of these so we can pick off a few things. For example, gait difficulties. It could be because of motor dysfunction from the frontal lobe. It could be because of sensory dysfunction. You don't know where your legs are from the parietal lobe, or it could be because of the cerebellum um, and coordination difficulties that come through with that. Um, as another example, cognitive deficits, it could be because of the frontal lobe um, or the interior frontal lobe, or you may have memory deficits that um, are resultant from temporal lobe lesions. So again, just to reiterate, um, MRIs are amazing um, and, and they exist to confirm what we can already know from a neurological examination. So to summarize um, the little blurb on localization that 
it, but I just did. When it comes to clinical presentations in brain tumors, anything can happen. So it's really important that we do a thorough neurological examination and localize based on that. And this is really helpful because you can often tell if you have one lesion or if there's a higher chance of you having multiple lesions or if there's just a diffuse process that's impacting how a patient is functioning. And oftentimes this is very, very helpful um, in times like this, when you don't have CT contrast or you're waiting for MRIs for sometimes weeks at a time. So what are the most common medical issues that DOM staff have to deal with? I would say the most common is probably seizures. Um, that's, that's usually what in my neurology practice we get consulted on most when we're on service at um, especially the Jervinsky and I, I know from the general as well. Um, the other thing that's very common um, for brain tumor patients is tumor-related functional decline. So the um, burden of disease itself can be so high that patients can deteriorate very quickly. Um, so you can have also tumor progression in between treatments where the tumor has just decided it's, it's not going to respond to the chemotherapy anymore. And um, there is rapid growth and rapid clinical decline. You can have um, an increase in basogenic edema in brain tumor patients that is very acute slash subacute um, in the context of either radiation treatment um, or radiation related changes or because of a dexamethasone taper that we typically tend to do once radiation has been completed. Um, treatment for this is typically restarting dexamethasone and then weaning off even slower than we did the first time, and that usually does the trick. You can also see radiation necrosis, which is essentially just this um, massive, um, you know, positive feedback loop of ongoing destruction, this like, um, uncontrollable destruction within normal tissues within the brain surrounding um, most likely areas that have been previously radiated. Um, this can occur anywhere between months to the first few years after radiation is completed, and this can be a fairly significant challenge for us to control. Usually we treat this with dexamethasone um, and or, or Avastin. And you can also just have cognitive decline and failure to cope due to the tumor or due to the aggressive treatments, including radiation and chemotherapy. Um, a number of our patients do get admitted for symptom management and supportive care if they deteriorate at a very rapid pace. Okay, so why do brain tumor patients actually have seizures? It's actually because of alterations in neuroexcitability. Because of the tumor biology, you have these massive biochemical shifts that are occurring in a very localized area um, where there is just uncontrolled cell growth. So what you get with that is localized hypoxia, significant inflammation. You actually have physical, structural, or architectural changes to the brain. Um, making the neurons more neuroexcitable. Um, and you have localized electrolyte changes or loss of homeostasis, it's homeostasis um, that just leads to irritation of the cortex. And that's typically where seizures arise from. And this can happen with primary or metastatic disease. All it takes is really physical irritation or systemic um, biochemical irritation. So for example, in patients um, who have systemic diseases, even if they don't have any uh, metastatic disease in the brain, you may see patients who have severe hyponatremia because of SIADH in the context of lung cancers. Um, you can have severe side effects of chemotherapy um, and in some types of systemic cancers, you can also have perineoplastic encephalitis. So all of these can easily um, lead to seizures. Sometimes in our brain tumor, actually oftentimes in our brain tumor population, the first presentation tends to be a seizure. So it's really important when you have a seizure patient in front of you to pay attention to how they present. Did they present with focal abnormalities? So um, you know, partial motor seizures or partial sensory seizures, and then did they secondarily generalize? In that case, this is more consistent with the lesional origin, and it may be more likely to be related to a localizable 
lesion such as a tumor, or did they are did they have a primary generalized seizure, which is less likely um, compared to what I've just discussed to be due to a, a a focal lesion or a brain tumor. For example, seizures that occur in sleep typically are um, frontal seizures, so they're from frontal lesions, so that can help you localize. Um, and it helps you prioritize when to get that MRI. Um, so seizures are much more common in the lower grade tumors than the high grade tumors when it comes to glioma. So grade two, grade three tumors, about 74% of them can have um, seizures, whereas the higher grade glioblastomas um, tend to have way fewer by about half um, present presenting with seizures. Um, and seizures are also less common in metastatic disease than in primary brain uh, tumors. So if a patient comes in, they have a known brain tumor and they have a seizure, it's very important that we start treatment right away. You do not need to wait for a neurology consult or an oncology consult before you do that. Um, and we certainly do not want to wait for an MRI or an EEG before starting treatment in these patients. So um, this is the last part of uh, my presentation. So we're going to be talking about anti-epileptic drug preferences in brain tumor patients. So um, in my practice, I do see a lot of general neurology patients uh, on consult service, but the outpatient practice is, is mostly brain tumor patients. And the considerations that I have in starting anti-seizure medications in these two populations is very, very different. Um, the evidence is actually best for patients who have had at least a single seizure in the context of a known primary brain tumor. So there's really no evidence for prophylactic anti-epileptic drug treatment in patients with gliomas. And there are some very important things that we consider um, when we choose AEDs in brain tumor patients. Firstly, are they going to be on chemotherapy? Do they have a systemic cancer where they're going to be on immunotherapy? And will they be receiving radiation? All of these things may increase um, your potential for seizures. And also, um, chemotherapy and immunotherapy may have increased interactions with whatever drug you choose to put them on for seizure control. And the second thing is, um, what is the age of the patient? Are they of a reproductive age? Are they going to be on this drug for, say, two decades? Or three decades, or are they going to only be on this drug for one or one or two years based on their life expectancy? Um, we look at other comorbidities. Do they have liver disease? And are we going to hit the liver twice with chemotherapy and anti-seizure drugs? And ultimately, it also comes down to patient preference because some of these side effects are, are pretty significant for anti-epileptic drugs. And when a patient only has a year or two to live, um, this, this has very large quality of life implications. So typical choices for brain tumor patients, Keppra is absolutely um, my number one choice for most brain tumor, brain tumor patients. Um, again, I have no financial incentive for um, saying that Keppra is my favorite, but um, the, the lowest functional dose for Keppra is 500 milligrams POBID. The maximum, that, that should say 2,000 milligrams POBID, not 200. Um, and we do often um, go up to 2,000 BID in brain tumor patients where we just can't get a, get, um, a good hold um, of their seizures. And again, the difference between general population anti-seizure medication and brain tumor population anti-seizure medication is that these patients have gone through, likely gone through surgery or are going to, um, they're going to go through radiation and chemotherapy. This means that they will have a vulnerable brain and overall they have become more vulnerable people because their life has changed. They're going through a lot. And it's really important that we tailor based on um, the overall picture of the patient. So Keppra does have um, more neuropsychiatric side effects than some of our other anti-seizure medications, but the frequency of it is actually extremely, extremely low. And the particular neuropsych side effects that um, we, we can often see is worsening of anxiety, um, psychosis, hallucinations, depression, mood lability. Um, 
most patients tend to tolerate at least 750 BID okay. Um, it is renally cleared, so we have to make sure that their renal function is okay before starting, you know, high, high doses or even, you know, reasonable doses. Um, and so it's important that we titrate the dose clinically to control seizures, um, but ensure that we're not decreasing their quality of life by worsening their anxiety, having them have hallucinations, et cetera. Um, in my experience, if a patient exp experiences hallucinations um, or psychosis, all I've had to do is cut down by 250 milligrams twice a day, and, and we have excellent control of their seizures and their psychiatric um, side effects actually just completely improve within a day or two. Um, so the reason I, most of us prefer Keppra within the neuro-oncology world is because it doesn't interfere with our chemotherapies, first line or second line, and it also doesn't in interfere with fluctuating dexamethasone doses. It's one of the most safe drugs to be on long-term relative to the other anti-seizure drugs. Um, it's quickly titrated up to a good dose and does not need any monitoring, and side effects are less common um, for this than other drugs, as I've explained. Lately, more people have started using brevaracetam, which is a cousin drug of, of Keppra. It has a very similar mechanism of action and has an even better side effect profile. I haven't quite switched um, to doing this because there isn't a ton of evidence within the brain tumor population, but I haven't, I've, I've seen good outcomes in the few patients that have been started on it. Um, by some of my colleagues. So you may be asking yourself, when can I prescribe Keppra by myself? You cannot go wrong if you've ensured that a patient does not have um, psychiatric comorbidities, uh, has properly functioning kidneys. If you want to start 500 milligrams POBID and you can't get a hold of a neurologist overnight and you're kind of caught no, not knowing what to do, nobody, none of us in the neuro-oncology team will ever get mad at you for starting Keppra on your own um, at a lower dose, at least to cover the patient um, for, for a short period of time. If you really don't want to continue with Keppra, it's very easy to switch out of it and start a new medication. So never worry about that. Um, so other, other drug choices um, can be leucosamide. It's fairly well tolerated, but in brain tumor patients, I have noticed that it, it's um, a little bit harder on them in terms of cognitive fog and cognitive function, because again, these patients have part of their brain um, that's been resected out. Um, they've had radiation, they've had chemotherapy, all of these things kind of cumulatively tend to impact quality of life. So um, I do use it, but um, I prefer Keppra. Um, so there is a propensity for leucosamide to cause um, PR prolongation in some patients. So uh, if there are cardiac concerns, I always get an EKG first before starting leucosamide. This can be titrated fairly quickly and does not need monitoring of levels either. And there's minimal interaction with our chemotherapies and steroids. Lamotrigine is another option. Um, it takes weeks to actually get to a reasonable level because there's a high risk of rashes or allergic reaction to the lamotrigine. So we have a very, very slow titration that takes, you know, a month and a half, two months to get, a, get to a reasonable level. So in brain tumor patients, we often don't have that kind of time available to us before we have to get somebody started on radiation. So I tend not to um, use this too often. And don't forget, this is something you can't do potentially with other types of seizure patients, but if a patient is having seizures because of a brain tumor, dexamethasone um, temporarily is always a secondary option in controlling some of that inflammation, that swelling, that irritation to the cortex. So drugs to avoid in brain tumor patients. I think traditionally anybody who came into the seizure with any uh, uh, would would get Tylantin. Um, we kind of cringe when we see this because it does cause some trouble for us when we go on to chemotherapy and it's really hard to switch out um, to a new medication from Dilantin um, 
in a short period of time sometimes. Um, it increases the risk of aplastic anemia when combined with chemotherapy. Uh, and when we have about 15% of our patients who have drops in their uh, platelet count or white blood cell count while they're on our chemotherapy, this kind of tends to confound how we deal with issues quite a bit. Um, and there are also long-term side effects and um, the levels do need to be monitored closely. Carbamazepine is, is the same thing. Valproic acid is also not ideal because there are lots of interactions. It can actually decrease the clearance of temozolomide. So if the chemotherapy is in the system longer, there's the potential for increased toxicity from the chemotherapy. Um, the, the chemotherapy and BPA can both affect liver enzymes. So that's always, um, you know, confounding factor. So I personally um, try to avoid these three drugs um, if at all possible. Okay, so we've kind of gone through a lot of topics here. So we've talked about the basics of brain tumors, metastatic disease and primary brain tumors. We did a little localization learning. <laughs> and we also discussed the basics of seizure management in patients with brain tumors. At this point, this may be your impression of us neuro-oncologists. Uh, I can assure you this is not what we look like and this is not what we do. So if you have any questions about um, any brain tumor patients that you're taking care of, please always reach out to any of us and, and we'd always be happy to help. We basically live at the cancer center, so reach out anytime. And I want to finish off my presentation by acknowledging our amazing CNS oncology team. Um, we very much work as a team at the Cancer Center. We do group um, new patient consults. So, you know, we have amazing radiation oncologists and we have a group of neurology, neuro-oncology, medical oncologists. Um, so so we're, we're always happy to help reach out to us at any time if you're struggling um, with management of any of your brain tumor patients on the wards. And that's it. Thank you so much. Dr. Kaladindi, thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive, very clinically relevant, being a general terms myself and well-structured uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have time for a few uh, questions. So please, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A uh, section, or if you would like to be uh, brought in to ask your question in person, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. I, I'm going to take privilege and start, uh, Mike, with, with a question related to the uh, acute treatment of uh, seizure in brain cancer. So if you have a patient who's unknown to have, not known to have a brain cancer, they come in to the emergency room, they're seizing, and most of the emerge docs or maybe an internist will throw on uh, phenytoin being the, <laughs> the traditional drug. And we think that it works fastest, right? So we load yeah. them and uh, you come in and you, then after the diagnosis, you're upset, right? So we don't want to do that. <laughs> so how could we, in, in general, I mean, I know there's not a seizure talk, but yeah. you know, it's, as you alluded, seizure is the most common presentation of brain uh, cancers that we see as uh, uh, internist. So how, what, what's your advice on how to manage that uh, situation that there may be uh, meds, but now they're coming with seizures, but not confirmed and, and how fast Keppra would work if we choose Keppra? <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. And a lot of it really depends on is this a seizure, is this a cancer patient, like a known cancer systemic malignancy patient versus a patient who's generally well coming in with a first time seizure. Um, in general neurology practice and epilepsy practice, we don't tend to start people on long term medications from just having one primary presentation of a seizure if there's no evidence of a lesional epilepsy. So absolutely, we treat acutely with all the emergency medications, but in terms of starting them on a home medication, there's really no evidence of benefit for automatically doing that unless there's clear evidence of epilepsy or they've had multiple seizures, we don't have an explanation. Um, whereas in the brain tumor population, if there is a high suspicion that these are metastatic disease, you know, they've got METs everywhere else, why would they not have CNS METs? Um, you're, you know, I think you have to do what you have to do to control the patient safely. So we'll never get mad at you. It's more that we do want to transition them as soon as possible to a drug that is going to be better tolerated where we have, um, where our chemotherapy or treatment options are not going to be impacted by. 
So what, what are the thoughts on, on how fast Kepra work and, and Dr. Halbrook in the, com, in, the, in the questions asking about IV uh, uh, Kepra? and available to that yeah and what's the use of it in, in that yeah system? so so we have a couple of iv options so um kepra iv is not available everywhere where i did my residency we had no access to iv iv kepra um but um i i believe we do do have access to it periodically here um since i've started i have seen it you have, you know, lacosamide is also an option for IV. Valproic acid is an option for IV. Um, I don't think any neurologist is really going to get mad at anybody for getting rapid control through IV dilantin. I don't think that's the wrong thing to do. It's more the long-term outpatient management with dilantin that causes us trouble. And so oftentimes what we do is we get control in the ED setting with with dilantin and then we start them on Kepra. We can orally load them on Kepra or if we have IV, that's okay too, but we try to do the transition preferentially earlier rather than later. That's 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 great. We, to my understanding, we do have access to IV Kepra in Hamilton Health Sciences. Yeah. I'm not sure if it needs a prior approval. Uh, if Anne knows anything, uh, please comment. Uh, that'd be great, Dr. Halbrook. Uh, another question, and I don't know if this is within the scope of this uh, talk, is actually about the uh, act mechanism of action of uh, Kepra being your favorite compared to Dilantin uh, in, and how, the, how, sorry, how does it work? Yeah, so, so Kepra is an SV2, it works through um, SVC2A receptors. So um, I, I think it's honestly, for me, in terms of efficacy, I think if you get good doses of both, I have never felt that Kepra was inferior to Dilantin in terms of controlling seizures. Um, I would say 99% of my brain tumor patients are not on Dilantin. That's good. That's good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions from Dr. Uh, Kernow. Uh, question about uh, pearls on driving uh, with brain tumors. Yes. Yeah, so I intentionally left that out of my talk because that, that's um, that was that's probably like five slides. So our approach to this is somewhat different from general epilepsy's approach to this. You know, we have fairly good guidelines in the world of general epilepsy in terms of when to take away the driver's license, when they can have it back. In the brain tumor population, we have no actual guidelines. So a lot of it tends to be cultural practices, institutional practices, and just how you're trained. Um, generally though, any person who's coming in with a brand new brain tumor, you have to report that to the ministry. There's no question about it. Um, I, I trained, so where I did my fellowship, nobody got their license back if they had a glioblastoma, like even if it's two years out, because I know they're going to grow. Um, so, you know, I can return a license and then three months later, if they grow and I haven't, ca I haven't caught it because we haven't had an MRI, we're putting other people at risk. There's no actual guidelines. I think what you can do is you report your objective findings to the ministry and ultimately it is their decision whether they... Um, return somebody's license or not. In general, what we've been doing at the Cancer Center is they don't drive for about a year from the point of diagnosis. We wanna see sequential MRIs post-treatment um, that show stability um, and a low expectation that they're going to progress anytime soon before we return that license. And secondly, a thorough neurological examination so they don't have deficits in their um, ability to reflexively react to quick things that are happening on the road. Their visual fields are are not impacted, etc. That's that's very very helpful. Just to clarify my understanding, so uh, you need you have to report irrespective of whether the their presentation is seizure or not. So it's like if you, yeah. once you diagnose them, you report them, and I'm assuming this is more done by then has to be done by the di first first person who. Diagnosed. Yeah, yeah, it's typically usually the eMERGE or the surgeons because they're they're kind of like the first gatekeepers before they even come to us at the cancer center. Fantastic. We um, there are a few other questions, but we're just on on time at nine o'clock, so we have to let people go for their usual work day. So really, thank you very much, uh, Navia, for this very very informative and uh, clinical useful presentation. 
and the discussion and I uh, wish everyone a very happy and enjoyable summer please make sure you take time for yourself uh, it's warming up it's very nice starting this uh, week so uh, have some good time for yourself make sure you take a break for you and your family and those who you love and uh, we'll get back to grand rounds in September uh, thank you everyone have a great day thank you